intro. Um, while we get the slides up, I just want to say that my dad's going to be really happy because I'm going to tell him that guess who opened for me? <laughs> this has got to be a highlight of a lifetime. And it's, it's, a, it's a real privilege to be here amongst all of you, actually. It's a, it really, you know, it's like the kind of space where you get a lot of goosebumps and it just gives you faith uh, that there are so many good people working to create an inclusive society. So I want to talk about this. I want to share, I want to share a little bit of my journey and the intention behind that journey and then expand on this idea of everyone is good at something. This is, uh, I want to start with a story of Shakuben. Shakuben has two kids, but when those two kids were young, her husband passed away. So she all of a sudden needed to go find a job. She becomes a janitor at a school. And so for the next 30 years, she's a janitor at a school taking care of her two kids. And that's something she did with her full heart. But she also had a, a heart of giving, a heart of generosity. So she always had this insight that, I want to give, but what can I give? I'm just a janitor. And then one point, at one point, she heard this story of Gandhi. Gandhi, it turns out, was sitting in his ashram, and he was writing with a pencil, and the next time he comes, the pencil's gone. And so he's looking everywhere for this small pencil. Now here's a father of a nation looking for a small pencil. Pencils are not that expensive. So people around him are like, Bapu, why are you looking for that pencil? Here's a big one. It was Kaka Saib Kalilkar. Was, it was next to him. And Kaka Saib says, you know, here, here's more than one. How many do you need? You don't need to look for a small pencil. Gandhiji turns to Kaka Saib and says, I want that pencil because that pencil was given to me by a child with a lot of love. It wasn't the size of the pencil. It was the size of the heart that was behind that pencil. That's what mattered. So Shakuban hears this story, and she says, oh, maybe I can also give if it's not about the size of the pencil, if it's about the size of the heart. I have a big heart. I want to give. She says, but what could I do? She decides from the next day, she, she is going through the trash. She's been a janitor at a school for so many decades. And so as she's going through the trash, she picks up those small pencils that people have thrown away, those chewed up erasers, those semi-blunt sharpeners, and she collects them. And she says, I will give it to somebody who doesn't even have this. They're small, but I'm going to put a lot of love into it. And so every day she would look through the trash and find these small things. I went to visit her for breakfast one day. And as I was leaving, she hands me, and I still remember this, she hands me this pink torn plastic bag. And as she hands it to me, I kind of feel it. it I'm, I live in the U.S. You know, I, I, I was born in, in Gujarat when I live in the U.S. In the U.S., when someone gives you a gift, you just open it, you know, right there. Like, here you don't do that. And so I was kind of confused and said, well, should I open it, should I not? So I kind of felt it, you know, I was still curious what it was. It turned out I didn't open it, but I knew that it was her first collection of these pencils, erasers, and sharpeners. I had to go to a next event. And at this next event, I shared Shakuben's story. I had that bag, so I opened, I, I showed everybody this bag, and I opened it up for the first time. I put my hand in there, and what I saw was all these small acts of love. It was so powerful. You could go to a store, and you could buy as many great erasers, as many great pencils, as many sharp, sharpeners, but you could not buy the love that it was wrapped in. And that was what I felt. I immediately started crying. So did everybody else around me, everybody else who was there. Because it wasn't about, it wasn't even about the words, it was the strength of her bhakti, if the strength of her devotion, strength of our love. And so this idea of not the size of this, but the size of the context around it is what has inspired my personal journey. We have been asking this kind of question, what designs emerge when we can value, when you can start to count what can't be counted? How can you count what can't be counted? Or how can you count what does count? How can you value the subtle? How do you value love? So this has been a guiding question for me. Service Space is the organization that we run, and it does a lot of things. But one of the curious aspects of Service Space is that it's volunteer run. So everyone is contributing small amounts, but they're doing it purely for love. And when you do it for love, a very different kind of energy emerges. 
And we have seen that. And what we also learned is exactly what the tagline here is. That when you're working with volunteers, you don't say, what are you best at? You say, hey, whatever you're good at, whatever you're good at, let's make, some, let's make an amazing quilt together. Let's create a unique kind of a fabric, a new possibility with your strengths and your strengths and your strengths and my strengths. You start looking at people's assets, not their weaknesses and deficits. So this guy had the same insight. I don't know how many of you guys know him. This is Vivan, Viroz's son. Thanks to Vivan, who taught us, directly or under, indirectly, this idea that everything, everyone, everyone is good at something. This is Firoz's son, who actually ended up changing his life. He's on the autism spectrum. Firoz had to process this. He's in the middle of writing a book on leadership, and he says, instead of going to the CEOs, I actually need to profile these people of incredible courage. And he writes this remarkable book. It's all a gift from this little kid, this cute kid. And what he showed us is that everyone is good at something. And that was something we have been repeatedly learning. Of course, there was a guy before Vivan came along that had the same insight. His name was Albert Einstein. Einstein said, everyone is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life thinking it is stupid. So how do we take this idea that we have in our society we have different kinds of capital, different kinds of value. And it's usually just equated with money. That's a very narrow idea of value. How can we expand that? So that was something we started looking into. So we talk about different kinds of capital. Right? Synergy, social capital, connection. Facebook connections are only going to get you so far. A hug is going to get you a lot farther than Facebook connections. Right. And, and you can go down the list from cultural capital to experiential capital to intellectual capital, spiritual capital, so many kinds of capital. And all of them turn, create a very different kind of value. I won't go into all of this, but it's just to give you an idea that it's not just money that creates value in our world. Right. And how do we think in this different sort of a way? So Vivan taught us that everyone is good at something. And that's great. And I want to expand on that. And three more, or three core insights. Everyone is good at something, but everyone can also be great at giving. Every single person, no matter who you are. And that changes the game. If we start to look at the world through that lens, it changes the game significantly. Martin Luther King, of course, taught, he spoke about this very eloquently. He says, everyone can be great because everyone can serve. We have so many leaders. This is Gandhi with J.C. Kumarapai, who's one of these remarkable economists of India. And at one point, all these people from Harvard came to visit Kumarapa. And when they're visiting him, they see that he lives in a very simple place. He has nothing on the walls, very simple guy. But he has two photos up on the wall. So first, they look at the photo, and they're like, oh, that's Gandhi. Kumarapa says, yes, that's my master. And on top of that, he had a photo of a bunch of ordinary villagers. And so they're like, wow, you have nothing else. You have Gandhi. We can understand that. What's that? Oh, he says, those are ordinary villagers. That's my master's master. That insight is a, is a really remarkable insight because Gandhi created a whole revolution thinking, like at the Dandi March, he's not saying this kind of person or this kind of person. He's saying everyone can be moved by love. And if you are moved by love, that capacity that you are engulfed in completely changes the interaction you would have in that moment with anybody. Even if that's the British soldiers about to whack you in the head, you would still say, may you be blessed. I oppose this action, but I love you. That's how Gandhi won, won so many hearts and changed the world. This guy, whom you haven't heard of, operated in the same way. That everyone can be great at giving. He, as you might tell from his photo, has no legs. He lost his legs to polio. And he said, at some point, if I managed, he was at the bottom of the bottom in society. He had nobody. He was begging out on the streets. He said, if at all I have food, shelter, clothing one day, I want to go serve people. So he got to that point. But he didn't know how to serve. Right? Most people say, you need to come and become like this, and then you will, you know, then, then, you suffer like me first, and then we'll talk about giving, you know? But actually, maybe he doesn't need to go through that suffering. Maybe he can just be who he is and give in his own way. So what did he do? He did something remarkable. Because he has no legs, he would scoot, right? Every time he would make this sound, and everyone would notice. 
But because he had no legs, he also was very endearing. Nobody was threatened by him. He lived in a slum community of 100,000 people. In the slum community, they had lots of problems, lots of domestic violence. So it so happened that the women who would get abused by these men would end up talking to Raghu. And they would, they would say, oh, Raghu, you know, this is my problem. This is and Raghu would go there, and he says, you know what? I want to do something kind for them. I want to be there for them, listen to them, but I also want to step it up. I want to give them something. So he decides to take these tulsi plants to all these people. And he would put a little incense, he would pray. He loved to sing. He was a big bhakt of Krishna. And so he's like singing. And he does these songs and they meditate and they're, you know, they're having a connection. But now it's a holy tulsi plant, so you can't throw that away. You have to take care of it. And in taking care of it, the family starts coming together. In a span of two years, Raghu gave away more than 900 plants. And that's, a, that's something that no CSR program could do. That's something that no NGO could do. That's something that only Raghu was uniquely positioned to do. He didn't need to grow up to be like me to then go out and deliver these kinds of particular kinds of skill sets. He was uniquely gifted to deliver this incredibly compassionate response in a situation where nothing else would have worked. So how can we start to think in this way that not only is everyone good at something, but everyone can be great at something? But here's the magic. This is one more photo of Raghu. That as everyone starts to think in the second way, the, a third thing happens, the third insight, the third sort of gateway into this incredible vista is that as that giving gets connected, a gift ecology starts to emerge. This is not transactional. This is not like, oh, you're famous, so let me like do this, or you're not famous, I don't care for you, or you're rich, or you're, no, it's like you just say that we're all connected. We're all related that I may give to you in a certain way, you may pay forward to somebody else, and that circle will come back around to me in some way, shape, or form. Can you make that practical? So we did an experiment in Berkeley. This is Karma Kitchen. I don't know how many, how many of you guys have heard of Karma Kitchen? No, Seva Cafe, wow, there are some people, that's awesome. Um, so on the other side of the world, we started a little restaurant. We took on a restaurant. Now in this restaurant, what would happen is that you would have a meal like every other place. When you have a meal, like any other restaurant, you would do what you need to do, but at the end, you get a check. And that check would read zero. It's zero because someone before you paid for your meal, and you have a chance to pay forward for somebody after you, whatever you want. You are trusted to pay forward. All the business school people, they come and they freak out. They're like, no, 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 this can't work. You can't trust human beings. And we're like, Okay, well, maybe if we shut down, we're just a bunch of young idealists. Maybe, you know, if we shut down, we'll be done tomorrow. Turns out, it went on and on and on for tens of thousands of meals now in 18 different places around the world. Right? All these people, they come in, volunteers take over this restaurant, and really remarkable things happen when your check reads zero. Imagine going to a place where there's 20 people outside, everyone is having this meal, and you, no one is paying for themselves. Everyone is paying forward for someone else. They are trusted to pay forward. They are trusted to respond with generosity. If their heart responds to generosity, will it or will it not? Turns out it does. There was no research on this. First, they were like scratching their heads. They said, oh, these guys, whatever they're doing, you know. Now they have research at UC Berkeley, seminal research. It was titled, Paying More When Paying for Others. Human beings, lo and behold, are actually compassionate, kind, and generous. You just have to trust them to do that. <laughs> I could tell you story after story um, of Karma Kitchen and how it changes the way in which people engage with each other. You know, one guy came in, he was super confused. He looks at the volunteer and he says, that's a nice shirt, it was a Karma Kitchen shirt. He says, uh, this guy, he said, where can I buy it? He says, sorry, you can't buy it. This is like something that's gifted to you. We don't sell anything here. And so this guy goes in, comes back to me, and he says, Nipun, do you have an extra T-shirt? And I was like, I thought maybe you spilled something. So I was like, I do. It's not a Karma Kitchen T-shirt, but you know, you can, you can wear this. And he goes in, changes T-shirts, goes back to this guy, and he says, you know, he, he puts a nice little note. He says, please, laundry before using, and he gives it to this guy. 
Imagine going to a restaurant and you're already confused by this paying it forward, and now you tell the waiter this is a great shirt, and the next thing you know, 10 minutes later, he, bring, he gives it to you, takes the shirt off his back. This guy didn't know how, how to respond. It was his first time in a setting like that. 10 minutes later, he calls that waiter back, who's a volunteer. He says, hey, man, can you come here? This is pretty amazing what you guys are doing. This is a testament to, like, the human spirit. I want to contribute, like, not even for the meal after. I just, my heart is overflowing. I work at eBay. Here's two $50 cards. Just, this is for Karma Kitchen. So this guy's like, okay, well, this is not even, he didn't know what to do. He comes to me. He says, here's 100 bucks. It's a lot of money for a T-shirt, right? So he said, he says, this is for Karma Kitchen. So I said, well, who is Karma Kitchen? All of us. He says, why don't you gift it? Why don't you ask him to give it to a random table? So this guy goes and is like, sir, thank you. But, you know, you gave it to Karma Kitchen. Karma Kitchen's all of us. Why don't you give it to someone else? He's like, who are you guys, you know? <laughs> What's going on? I'm trying to give you money, and you're saying? So he says, look, I'm shy. I can't go to a random table. But I'll tell you what. So this, this server says, I'll tell you what, I will go give it, you just watch. He goes to a table, on this table this woman, also was there for the first time, is sitting with her young son. The young son has brought a piggy bank. The mom wants him to know what does it feel like to pay forward for somebody else. First to feel gratitude for somebody who came before you whom you can't see. And then to pay forward for somebody who's never going to look you in the eye and say thank you, you were amazing. You don't do it for those reasons. You do it because of something else within you. But we're never, we never trust that process. There's no spaces to experiment. So she brought her son. And this guy comes and says, hey, someone's cup of gratitude overflowed. So he gave it to Karma Kitchen, and you're Karma Kitchen, so here you go. And this woman's like, it's, does it rain money here? Where, am I in heaven? Where am I? You know, Totally different. It, same thing happened to another place. And that guy who's two gift cards they were, he's completely turning red, pink, and purple, you know, he's like, who are these people? It was the same, it just, in a space of generosity, totally different rules, totally different possibilities. So imagine a culture, if we're rooted in this kind of love, in this kind of an engagement, where we assume value in every interaction, where we try to see the good in everybody, and we know that not only is everyone good at something, they can be great at giving in this very moment, every single person. If we work, if we meet the world with that kind of love, remarkable possibilities are open to us, not just as individuals, not in our local context, but I think the whole world. This guy has applied this. He runs his magazine in this way. This is my friend Richard Whitaker. He runs an art magazine for many years. He took all, subscri all subscription fees off. And he says, from now on, only offerings of gratitude. Someone before you has paid for you, you get to pay forward, whatever you're moved to. Right? This person is running an acupuncture clinic, Twi Win, in the same way. But I want to tell you the last story of this guy. This is Udebai. He's also a very dear friend. Now, rickshaws, you sit in a rickshaw and you say, I want to go from point A to point B. It'll take you to so many other places around, right? And you come home and you're like, oh, God, you know, this happens in India, like all this. And you're justified in feeling that. Like, if I want to go from here to there, it would be nice if the society was honest. But it would also be nice if you go live in his home and you see that he lives in a home that's, you know, very small, nine of them in that small space, most of them sleeping outside at nights, and he has the same dreams for his kids. And he's just shortchanged by society, so much inequality, that he looks at somebody like me who's not local, and he says, hey, tourist tax, buddy. You know, he kind of takes me around. Right? So you say, okay, well, both sides are kind of justified. Who's going to break the stalemate? This guy, Udaybay, says, I will break the stalemate. You sit in my rickshaw, no charge. No charge because someone before you has paid for you, and you are trusted to pay forward for somebody after you. A rickshaw driver, this is not Bill Gates doing philanthropy. This is not saying, hey, go out and do all this and then do your giving. This is a guy that would be a UN statistic. And he says, I believe that if I give you a ride out of love, you will respond with love. In Ahmedabad, in a city, one of the sixth largest city in India, he decides to do this. He's still doing it. I just saw him yesterday. Everyone asks him. He was all over the news, right? Everyone says, so, how does it work? Is it working? Are people paying? Everyone's kind of curious. He says, yeah, yeah. And we told him everyone's going to ask you that, so have a notebook. He says, here's the notebook. Point A to point B, some people gave a little 
more, some people gave a little less. On average, he says, it evens out, roughly what I used to make before. But then he says, let me show you another book. Takes out another book, and he says, this is the notebook in which I asked them how they felt sitting in my rickshaw. And people took vows for life. They said, wow, if a rickshaw driver believes in love, why do I have so much and I am not able to believe in the good in people? Why is that? And in that moment, they start to really transform themselves and they write about it. And they write these amazing things. I could tell you story after story of how incredibly moving it is for them. And he says, yeah, here's the economic output, but here is the real output of believing in the goodness of people. So such kinds of possibilities are possible when first we see that everyone is, we start with this idea that if we can count what counts, we realize that everyone is actually good at something. When we see that everyone has a gift, we come to this insight that everyone can be great at giving. Every single person in any moment can hold a heart of generosity. And if that generosity, if that mindset starts to turn into action and that generosity gets connected, a gift ecology starts to emerge. It's a totally different paradigm. And here's the last bit. If that kind of a gratitude emerges, we come to this fundamental insight, which the sages have talked about since the age of dawn, that everyone is connected to everything. And that is a really powerful idea. If you start to think of every single moment and say this is connected to everything else, really remarkable possibilities can be in front of us. But for the tech guys, you know, there's this new thing. So it used to be, I, I'll show you this graph. It used to be that we did things in a very one to many way. This is one to many. I am one, you are many, right? It's a broadcast model. This is how we did TV. This is one to one. This is telephone model. Right? We, we talk to each other, you can all talk to each other, a lot more connections are possible. Right? But now, in the era of the internet, we actually have this possibility. Many to many. Group forming networks. You can form a group of three, you can form a group of two, you can form a group of five, and we could do that across the board. Now, if you just had 50 people in a room, scientists study this, and they said, how many people would you have how many connections in this kind of a network? In the first one, it's called Sarnas law. You would have 50 connections, of course. One to 50. How many in the one to one? So this is Metcalf's law. And Metcalf's law says there would be 1,225 if we all connected one to one. If you just had 50 people in this room and you actually empowered and unlocked this remarkable many to many network, just 50 people, how many connections are possible? Reed's law tells us it would be 100 million trillion. That's 50 people. We're all in this room, way more than 50. If all of us can ignite this, this is not a thing of technology. This is a thing, we're already wired with this technology. We're already wired to recognize the internet, not the internet, the internet. And as soon as we act in this way of love, all of a sudden, we're put into this matrix. And this is the possibility. If we want to create a movement, it, the in, you know, here we are at the India Inclusion Summit. We're trying to create this movement. And that movement, if all of us just take on to this idea of not just consuming, but also contributing and thinking in this different way and connecting and synergizing, man, we have trillions and trillions of connections possible here and now. So I hope that we can all continue to live in this way. I'll end, I feel like I'm just spontaneously riffing, but I'll end with this one last thing, which is a quote by a Buddhist monk. A Buddhist monk was in front of all these people, and he raises up a piece of paper, and he says, what do you guys see here? He says, I see a sheet of paper. He says, where does the piece of paper come from? And someone says, oh, it comes from a tree. What does a tree need to survive? Uh, it needs water. Okay, where does the water come from? And so there's some kid, you know, he hadn't taken his science classes, and he says, it comes from the clouds. Sure. This monk turns to everybody, and he says, how many of you can see the cloud in this piece of paper? 
If we can just see the cloud in that piece of paper, all of a sudden, the game changes. And I think that's the invitation that Firoz, Sridhar, and the entire team are inviting us to do. So I hope we take maximum advantage of that, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nipun, for opening our hearts. I forgot to mention that Nipun has also been given the Unsung Hero of Compassion Award by Dalai Lama. He's also the <laughs> recipient of the Jefferson Prize for Charity, and he's been appointed by the President of USA, Barack Obama, on a special council for poverty and inequality. So he's truly a symbol of giftivism. I would like to call upon India's foremost speed painter, Vilas Nayak, to give a memento to Nipun, and then both of them can sign that beautiful IIS painting.